I mean, technically, based off the the YouTube thing, we're early because I I pushed us back. You said you were stuck in stuck in the woods, Griff. And so I was stuck. That's I right. Was... I just why did I why did I think you were stuck? Why did you editorialize that? Well, I have been stuck in the woods before, and perhaps you were just referencing mm. um, that metaphorically. We're stuck in the woods of uh, robot tweets. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, apologies for the five day hiatus, chat. I yeah. uh, someone asked me if I was well. I am well. I am well. I've got over my man flu, but I did go on holiday. Had a spontaneous holiday, and then Griff. You... I was like, Griff sounds so much better today, and I think that's because he's no longer ill either. Yeah, I am over my cold um, yeah. or allergies, either one. Because the thing about podcasting is it's it's difficult. It's 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 a really um, high stress little gig. Um, Maddie, where'd you go? Did you go to West Virginia? <laughs> no, mm. I didn't. Did you go to George <laughs> Ezra's house in Budapest? No. Mm. You know that song? It made its way out there. It was like top 10, whatever, <laughs> like all over the planet. <laughs> yeah, true. That's crazy. Yeah, I went to Budapest. It was, it was nice. It was it was okay. Nice. Very nice architecture. Had some goulash. Had, nice. Uh, yeah, hey, you know one thing? I, I think we have a one or two. Didn't we have Tamas, who's originally Hungarian in the, in the chat? And maybe one or two other Hungarians. The curd cheese thing, that's got to that's got to stop. Like, why why are we having curd cheese with everything and cottage cheese and so there's a candy bar, right? Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, that looks great because I saw a picture of it. It was actually like a drawing because I was trying to try as many Hungarian things as possible as you do, right? And the candy bar has uh, so it's like a white filling. So you're like yummy love love white fillings um yeah and the coating is chocolate so i was like that's a banger gonna have that and guess what the white filling is is cottage cheese oh wow yeah yeah now people may point towards the fact that uh, you know cheesecake is a thing and other people enjoy cottage cheese but nah and the other thing which happened griff was hmm. had uh we went to a strudel place me and uh okay my special someone and at the strudel place i chose the poppy seed filling which uh poppy seed very authentic i believe right mm -hmm. that was a mistake i should have had poppy seed and sour cherry but anyway the, mm. po the poppy seed was very poppy seedy so i got what i asked for anyway emily uh she she had um raspberry curd and she ordered it thinking like it was like a lemon curd, right? And I yeah. was like, just as she ordered it, I was like, ah, you know, yeah. the curd might be curd cheese. Yeah. And so what it was, was loads of curd cheese with like a little, like a dot of raspberry occasionally. Mm. That very cheesy strudel. And she wasn't, she wasn't pleased. I take She it. wasn't enamored with the choice. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, how far off was it from the, the cheese filling and like, say, a cheese Danish pastry? A cheese Danish? What's that? Oh, my gosh. Here we go. <laughs> really? All right. Have you ever heard of like a raspberry Danish before? Yeah, a a of Danish course. pastry? Of, of course. Have you heard of a cheese Danish? No. Really? Okay. Well, so... You can buy different iterations here. I've never been a fan of the Ooh, cheese Danish. I'm reading about it. It's making me uncomfortable. I mean, it's really not not well, that offensive the, of a flavor. No, it's it just more the the composition really is what gets me, the ratios. It's a little too cheesy. But it's kind of like a sweet cheese. <laughs> it's not like real Yeah, this cheese. is the thing. This is the thing. It's America, so we can rely on the fact that there's a ton of sugar in it. And also cream cheese frosting, that's like a big deal, right? Yeah, and I imagine it's kind of verging on that spectrum. Whereas the cottage uh, cheese, the curd cheese, uh, the at least what I tried in Hungary. Please don't come at me, uh, many Hungarian listeners. But uh, 
it was it was savory. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was savory, and that's it. Yeah. Now, what it did have savory. there was uh, they they had uh, this thing called a. Uh, well, I, well, here's the deal. Hungarian is a very difficult language. Mm-hmm. So, but they had a thing called a chocolate snail, I believe the uh, translation is. Now, that was good. It, so was it act, an actual snail? No. It was oh. a pastry like a snail. Like oh. A cinnamon oh, swirl, oh, 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 gotcha. Yeah. So, so you wonder with the, um, the high frequency of all this cottage cheese filling, you wonder is it <laughs> like, hey, would, wouldn't this pastry – like, doesn't it need some cottage cheese, or do you think it's more like the local farming industry is like, well, we've got all this excess cottage cheese. What do we do with it? So it starts making its way the into surplus various... of the cottage cheese. Yeah. Um, anyway. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know why it's so popular. That would be something to delve into. Food history is is interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, so many staples just are just extend from like what's available and like what's right, you know, right. frequent and right? hungary does have a, a very interesting history yeah you know a lot of occupation and uh yeah quite interesting i might be being ignorant of the cottage cheese love i hope not <laughs> for me to be ignorant um, on a podcast would be very being bad ignorant on a podcast what do you call seattle overload right right Hit um, it, Maddie. It, it was good to see you. Uh, it's good to see people in the chat. Thank you. Was I premature? I mean, slightly. I just wanted to. Uh, ah. That's a good preamble football topic. Superman not question. quite getting the. Uh, getting the. You know, this isn't about football. Like, <laughs> come on now. Um, Still yeah, a good that question. Is, that is a good preamble uh, football topic. Do we want to answer it or are we Yeah, would you rather time? Jaron Reed at cornerback or Reed Gwillen at nose tackle? See, I'm thinking if you put Jaron Reed at corner, you you would just have him play off 12 yards. And then you're asking him to 12? tackle in space. Well, either way, you're giving up the go. I mean, if you if you have him play a cloud corner, but you're yeah. really limiting your scheme. Right, right. And meanwhile, like Reed Gwillen at nose is just gonna be you're going to play two, three techs either side of him and have him shoot his A gap. And uh, <laughs> you're going to play a bare front, basically. Hmm. I'm going to go with Reek. Uh, except, except Jaron Reed would actually play a cloud and get a reroute. Whereas Reek Bullen, uh, with the contact we've seen from him in recent games, he may not be cut out for nose tackle, I'd suggest. Yeah. Might have yeah. to be Reed. Reed is a cloud corner. And you could send him on a on a, on a cat flip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. All right. Welcome to the Seattle Overload Podcast. We are back with Oh, actually, hold on. Let's do this as well. I'm so sorry. I forgot about you guys. I didn't really. Let me fix my banner as well. My Bang. dogs might be making cameos tonight. Yeah, we've got some nice bells. It always it always seems festive. Yeah. Which it's not right now. Anyway, welcome to the Seattle Overload podcast where we have Seahawks signings roundup. Nose tackle Jonathan Hankins, linebacker Jerome Baker, defensive back Kayvon Wallace, and guard Tremaine Ankrum have joined the Seahawks. We're going to talk about those signings. We're going to break them down. We're going to talk about our tape observations. We're going to project their fit to the Seattle Seahawks. We also have another, it's funny how this happens, might be a weekly thing, but another John Schneider radio interview. So we can talk about that. And after, I mean, it's basically the third wave, what, third wave, third wave of free agency already. I guess we can sort of look at wider takeaways of what the Seahawks have done, 
There's still some interesting names left on the market. Seattle isn't completely out of cap space, but yeah, there's certainly some takeaways we can have about how free agency's gone and, and all that stuff too. So, Griff, you have a lot of power right now. How so? Well, don't let it go to your head, but you can choose uh, choose your own adventure. Mm. Which free agent would you like to talk about first? Let's talk um, the, the, the oldest big one that we haven't talked about. The one that is the opposite of most recent would be Jerome Baker. Right. Because we already talked about Dodson, right? We did. We did. Okay. So Jerome Baker... <laughs> And then how Schneider's, about him? How about that? Um, well, one year up to seven million, right? Correct. But we don't have per details on that. For Adam no. Schefter, I don't know why we haven't gotten details. I, I hope it's um, I hope it's like base value three four million, and you know incentive seven million. Um, but um, I, I like that move in isolation. I think that's a, a good move. His 2023, he was injured. Um, all, but on top of that, um, I wasn't really a fan of it. I, I was kind of alarmed. I'm like, is this really what's the best that's out there right now? Um, the fact that they signed him, you know, um, at, a, at a contract that was more expensive than Dodson suggests that they do think that he – if there's more there, right? That's just that's how that works. That's an indicator that of what they think of him. Mm. Um, you go and watch 2022, which I did. I watched a handful of games, and he played in the scheme where you know they ask, <clears throat> excuse me, where they ask more of him, and um, he can clearly play. Um, I think that like just to like put labels on it, I think he's firmly above average in coverage. I looked for the games where. Um, well, they played a bunch of cover three. They didn't play a bunch of cover three um, that year. But I looked for the games, you know, where, where they did. Because some teams, even that don't play a lot of cover three, they'll have a game or two where they do. Um, and you can find out really quick how good a linebacker is in coverage if they play cover three. Whereas if it's a bunch of quarters, you kind of have to keep digging in till till you start to find the reps that kind of matter in terms of trying to eval a linebacker or, or an interior zone defender and, and project that to another too high potential team. Um, so cover three, just kind of, it's harder to hide a guy, so to speak. Um, and he was playing Mike. So it's not like if you play weak rotation, he's just, you can hide him in the flat. Like that's a way to hide a guy play him in the flat. Right. Um, mm -hmm. not that the flat defense isn't important. It still is, no, but, but um, generally less space, less people to worry about, less potential root combinations to worry about, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Right. So, um, like either they didn't ask him to carry, you know, they didn't ask him to carry the the Tyler Lockets of the world when they would align in the slot as the number three receiver, and he's in the weak hook. But you know the four six four seven running Tyler Boyd's, yeah, and he can carry that guy. He can carry Keenan Allen at four who runs a four seven a four six mm. um, if he opens to it with good footwork. But you know he he did show that he can't exactly carry. If if he was if he was lined up in a pure one on one with say Rondale Moore, even though Rondale mm -hmm. Moore isn't good, but he's still running a four three, like he can't handle that um, unless he opens to it really conservatively. There are some reps where he was lined up where he had a final three match responsibility, kind of carrying that over. And um, that there we go, final yeah. three match gets the the doggos excited. Yeah, he's Ali is um, got opinions. He's Ali, okay. Yeah, and um, she she's a real ball knower. Brady doesn't care so much. Oh. Um, Brady Brady's more he's more got cap opinions. Um, <laughs> um, he's he's a finance major. Remember, <laughs> anyway. So uh, th there's a couple of them where like he just doesn't play it very urgently, and I wonder like what's going on there. Like he 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 gives he gives the route up basically, and he doesn't get targeted, so he gets lucky. But I'm, I there's some reps that are just kind of hard to square but he clearly has the traits for them so the, the the thinking there is okay well mcdonald put a lot on roquan smith's shoulders to a lesser mm. degree patrick queen um so uh, obviously the, the, there will be emphasis there then furthermore when he's like spot dropping and stuff i mean he has a sense like he knows where the windows are based off of offensive formation and tendency just occasionally like you know i'm used to watching jordan brooks right so 
and like peak Bobby Wagner as a frame of reference and KJ Wright. And yeah, even Cody Barton in Seattle. And he's just wrong more often than those guys are in coverage when it comes to feeling stuff that you can't see and, and, and uh, like eyes in the back of your head type stuff. But he still has a sense there, a sense that Tyrell Dodson, when he's spot dropping, does not convey to the audience. Like it's so th- th- there's a clear drop off there, I think. Um, I think it's interesting that they, I think it's interesting that they put, um, that they, that Schneider anointed him like the weak side linebacker because he's played both. Um, and I think that indicates pretty clearly that, that they are, in the in the draft when they go when they draft linebackers that they're looking for a mike a middle linebacker archetype um and that they think that mac maximizing baker will will come at will so there actually is some interesting commentary there in a vacuum i like the move i mean i think it's a cool move um i am interested to see what the the real cap numbers are though yeah and yeah that's the schneider comments uh griff's alluding to he spoke on the radio today with uh wyman and bob and mentioned how the coaching staff views Baker as a will and Dodson as the mic. And yeah, Drift, I, I agree with your read. Dodson cannot be your first string mic if you want to be competitive. Uh, well, maybe we can talk about that a bit down the line. But And basically, I guess where it comes with Baker versus, you know, is he a will, is he a mic? Well, he moves well in space and he's currently... Well, he has been listed at 225 pounds so he's a bit lighter you generally want a bit more size at the mic spot if that's possible that being said at the combine he was 229 pounds uh ran a four by three second 40 which is impressive slightly shorter arms again hinting more like a wheel than a mic and he had a pretty decent three cone as well for a 229 pounder 6.93 6.93 seconds three cone good jumps etc etc athletic and after a 2021 season where I think he was playing a bit of like outside, uh, probably will, right? Probably will. Uh, but I think they did use him kind of on the edge in their like five front look as well. A bit like how Jordan Brooks yeah. got used on the edge. Yeah. Um, but then he signed a three year, $39 million contract in uh, June 2021, which like that's a pretty good payday, especially, you know. Prices keep going up, but that's a decent payday, even with the not all of that being guaranteed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But fast forward to 2023, well, he sprained his MCL in, uh, I believe it was week 13 of 2023. Then was placed on injured reserve, and uh, the contract negotiations fell through between him and the Dolphins. And so he's basically signing a one-year prove-it deal um, to, to land back uh, on, on the free agency market where he's proved his worth again, turns 28 uh, on Christmas Day. Oh, my word. His birthday is Christmas Day. How exciting for him. So I I really like the move. Like, I think, you know, he's played some good football in the league. I think he can run and hit. Maybe his best football, um, you know, you have to see how this knee thing shakes out. But Right. I, I, you that know, is a concern, I think. Right, which explains, you know, the, the lower cost. But, you know, if you get him up to speed in the McDonald's system, it seems pretty intriguing. Yeah. Um, agreed. And um, against the run, like I know you mentioned he could play on the edge and stuff. I, I don't think he doesn't really have the sand in his pants to be like a major factor against blockers. Um, I, I think he gets by is more what it is, um, and he's pretty quick. Um, he moves laterally well in the, in the short areas. Um, it, it really does feel like McDonald is like, okay, this guy can be my Patrick Queen. If, if like, peak outcome scenario, right? Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see there. Like you said, three years, 39 million, that's 13 million APY. I think based off of 2022, that's a little steep. But I would say more or less they were getting what they paid for in that market at that point in time. Hmm. And it's just funny to see what happened to the linebacker market this this year. Um, and I'm not sure why why it tanked, but like part of the reason why I was like Brooks is 
I would pay Brooks X amount is because, well, relative to the guys that were making the eight to 13 million, like Brooks is simply better than Jerome Baker was in Miami. Um, so it, it is kind of shocking what, what, what's happened. Like Baker himself, if he was cut, I mean, he deserves, if, if, if he was cut last year after 2022, he would have deserved to go sign Brooks's deal somewhere, for example. And Brooks yes. got three years 30 with stipulations. So I don't know. It's it's weird what happened at linebacker. And it's also weird that these deals happen so quickly to for them to be cheap. You'd think like over time they would become cheaper and cheaper throughout the free agency process. Um, but it was like they they went early and they went cheap early. I don't know. I find it odd. But yeah, it's it is unusual. And Obviously, Baker's supposedly going to be playing next to Dodson. Well, Dodson, just the coverage stuff. Like I know he grades well or whatever per PFF. And there's we've spoke before about how that's shaky. I mentioned that Pittsburgh game. I went back and watched it uh, with the actual 22 and not just some guy chopping up uh, pretty specific clips. And, uh, yeah, it's... Um, there's a lot that he would need to learn for, for the coverage stuff, I think, to work. But he can run and hit, and he flows well to the football, uh, processes like line of scrimmage stuff really well, and like sp split action and, and pullers and flows outside from inside out well. I think he's better in the middle in that sense, along with the fact that he just has a bit more of a density to him, which, which says Mike. But in terms of an area to upgrade, you have to be getting aggressive at Mike. Obviously, you don't want to force a pick, which is another thing Schneider spoke about in this interview, um, about how they don't go need until they're towards the end of the draft, but they're, they're more trying to get the best player available, first and foremost, and maybe we haven't seen that always with Seattle, and Schneider in, in recent... Uh, Interviews has also kind of admitted that what they get into problems when they force a need too high into too high a tier. But the last two drafts, you can say they've pretty much picked best player available, especially in the first five, six rounds. So that being said, even with inside backer not being necessarily a highly drafted position, getting a mic like a, a Junior Colson, for instance, who is obviously coming from a similar defense to Mike McDonald system, uh, played under Mike McDonald. That would be a savvy move. We broke down his tape along with um, Barrett of Michigan in the national championships, so make sure you check that out. But we are a fan of both their games. Colson obviously being more of the Mike type, but they Daddy, have to... Go ahead. You was going to say you got to watch Jalen Ford eventually. So I'm curious what, what you what you'll think the, of him. The Texas the Texas linebacker. Okay, I'll, do you know what Griff for you? I will. Thank you, and and only for me. Don't don't do it. Don't do it for for the audience or or for the love of the game. Do it for me. Yeah. Well, you did watch the the Dodson Pittsburgh game, so. I did, against yeah. my will. But ultimately, Baker would be such a nice move if you had someone like, say, Jordan Brooks as your mic. Um, Honestly, like, it would have been a very cool situation if they had Brooks and Baker back there. I would feel, like, really good about – I would not be sweating safety at all. You, you could have – whatever. Go draft a third-round safety. Go play ball. Who cares? But yeah. whatever. And I still don't get, like, why would you draft Brooks in the first round where you have to pay him $12.2 million over the first four years and then you won't pay them what he got, which was $16 million guaranteed over the next three years? Again, it does seem like he probably just took that deal before they expected it. Anyway. Yeah. Kayvon Wallace, described as a veteran defensive back, which... uh I guess that means that even though he's still relatively young, like he's 26 years old, he's been on uh, now four different NFL teams already. He was a 2020 fourth round pick out of Clemson of the Philadelphia Eagles. He was cut by them, picked up by the Cardinals in, in 2023. 
uh, waived um, on October 24th uh, after starting five games with the team, claimed off waivers by the Titans and played uh, some football for the Titans too. So finally kind of got his opportunity, albeit on two different teams in 2023, to, to break out. I mean, if you look at his athletic testing at the Combine, coming out of Clemson, uh, he ran a 4th I 3 second 40 at 206 pounds, 5'11". Uh, he had a 6.76 seconds, 3 cone, 38-inch oh. vertical, 11-foot-1 broad jump. He's incredibly athletic, and that kind of shows up on tape drift where I don't think he's... I actually haven't seen any contract terms out for him yet, but he doesn't seem no. like the most uh, athletic type of guy. Uh, sorry, he, he does seem like a very athletic type of guy, but it doesn't all quite come together. Agreed. Um, I, I watched him against Jacksonville. Who did you watch him against? Uh, Houston. Houston. So against Jacksonville, I chose Jacksonville because they use a lot of spread formations. And and that quickly, like, the, those formations are conducive to, like, how does a quarter safety handle, you know, well, basically playing uh, – Two, two to one, like with you got your slot and then you have to go read the outside receiver, depending on what happens. How do you handle that space, you know? Um, and I mean, does some things okay? You clearly see the traits. He's a little like uncontrolled with his movements. I feel like he kind of wastes steps. He's not exactly proactive, but he's super reactive. And I, and like he doesn't hesitate, but I'm not sure that he's always making like the right decisions frequently enough. <laughs> Um, when he's played to the field, he has like he, he has like functional range. As he, he, I wasn't really there weren't a lot of example there weren't a lot of examples where he was really tested though. Um, and I don't just mean tested by the quarterback, but I mean by the the route concept. So um, it was hard it was hard to gather too much. Um, I did see him play down a little bit, um, and but ultimately. Ultimately, I kind of viewed it as, well, he's kind of like a boundary scene player. That's what Julian Love is, and that's what Rayshon Jenkins was in Jacksonville. One of these guys is going to have to play the digs or play to the field, play a little bit of deep. Now, they're going to want interchangeability out of all three of them. I think that's the main thing. But one guy is still going to have to – I mean, and they're all kind of jack-of-all-trades, but, but still, like, one guy's going to have to do something that they're a little – less good at at their other things mm. um so it's going to be an interesting shaking shaking out um i really wonder if they have a couple of guys circled in the draft in particular but Matt, maddie what did you think of him well yeah i think that you know the context of his situation in that you know he's drafted into a jim schwartz defense he then spends the following two seasons uh, trying to acclimatize uh to a uh, Jonathan Gannon, like Fangio style defense, which yeah, there's similarities, but it's a different system. He's coming from a Clemson defense where they do so much that I, or di at least did uh, back then, especially uh, completely uh, Venables Brent 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 Venables' defense where they they just throw so much at a wall, and I wonder how much you actually really get a chance to develop. Whereas maybe you're, as a DB, you're kind of prioritizing just like being able to do a lot of different things. <laughs> And so, uh, I don't, and I'm not saying it's a, a jack of all trades, master of none situation, but I do think, you know, like the Titan stuff I watched, he was more of their high guy than more their high safety. Where mm. he's, 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 you know, if you're going to play a deep half and a deep quarter, he's probably playing in the deep half. But as an alternative, you occasionally put him down into the weak hook of cover three. You'll occasionally play him in a curl flat uh, down uh, and get his movement skills. Uh, kind of sailing underneath a, a talented uh, X receiver, say. But he's just like, I, I don't know if, like, it, again, Texans game, I don't know if they were asking him not necessarily to to match the final three and just really camp in a dig window or, like, heavily play to one side of a dig. Like, you know, thinking uh, the way that those digs wrap around a certain route and it can be on the backside or the front side uh, and that right. sort of thing. But... He uh, really looked like he wasn't very aware doing that sort of stuff. But I guess from a McDonald perspective, he's done a lot of things. You kind of hone him in, um, whatnot. But right. he certainly doesn't seem like the big nickel type of player who you thought is the missing piece when they, they got Julian Love and they got uh, Rayshon Jenkins. So who plays big nickel? 
is kind of up in the air. Like, could Wallace do it? Uh, probably not. I think he's a bit too small and light. Like, I don't think you're getting enough of the advantage. I mean, maybe it's Julian Love or, or I mean, maybe yeah. Kobe Bryant. Um, but it's yeah. Uh, we'll have to see. So, really interesting thing to monitor. I think the other thing to uh, mention with Wallace is obviously he's he's been a special teamer. So yeah, good for him. And he mentioned in his interview of Seahawks.com, um, the safety position is one that's so versatile. You can do so many different things with it. And I feel like I can, add, I can add some versatility. I can play closer to the ball. I can play deep half. I can go out there and cover whatever you need me to do. I don't want to sit here and say I'm just this one position. I feel like I'm a defensive that that can play any position you need to play. I'm just going out there to perform at a high level and trying to win. Uh, he also mentioned he liked the system McDonald had in place in Baltimore and described himself as a football guru. I watch a lot of defensive players' systems and seeing how guys play well in those systems. So he's signing here to really kind of try and capitalize on on the McDonald effect on safeties. So right. something to monitor. Schneider said on the yeah. radio he was a bit surprised they were able to get both Wallace and Rayshon Jenkins, which felt... Um, like ridiculous <laughs> he also mentioned how there's a lot of safety still out there that is interesting um yeah uh i mean if you if we use geno stone as a reference point he is i mean and he tested like it. he's a very like unimpressive athlete <laughs> um and i i <laughs> sound so wow. rude, but, but uh he's he's assignment correct and high effort and that counts for a lot and you know, he wasn't an assignment correct early on, but then he was. And and that's assignment correct within this kind of role that McDonald crafted for him. So you think, well, if if McDonald can theoretically do that with, you know, at least objectively speaking, a very below average athlete by athletic testing, then well, what can he do with what can he do with these guys? So I, I certainly see the the thought process. Mm -hmm. Um I, I do think writ large though. The players they have brought in are by and large quite average or perhaps below average, uh, unless you want to say like relative to being a role player, they're an average role player. I, I'm not I'm not I'm not being negative over the McDonald hire at all. I think that he's a great coach. I think that he was every bit the, the best hire they could have made. But in Baltimore, his first year in Baltimore, there is a huge contrast still, despite the Geno Stone thing, huge contrast still with the the aggregate talent in the back seven in Baltimore. Uh, and, the, right and the front seven. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I would say that the D-lines are actually pretty comparable in terms of okay. like talent. I know there's some style concerns in that you wrote well, about. Well, in investment as well. Um yeah, but Baltimore's well, level of investment there kind of surprised me. Yeah. Um, investment meaning that they've spent more and drafted higher than you would yeah, have thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, so let, let's lay that out. So obviously the draft is a huge part of this. They're, they're not done. They they had to accept that they weren't going to be as talented this offseason or they choose they chose to accept that path by by getting rid of some players or players not wanting to be here and you know they they're they're still paying their safety position a lot of money via the, the dead cap hits right um so like they knew that they weren't going to get a quandary digs level player in free agency like they, they're they're clearly trying to like clear the books get a bunch of guys on one year deals let them play survivor draft well then we'll regroup and see who we're going to keep next next season um yeah, and the the one year players, and there's there's a few more we can talk about in a second. That they're, they're all seemingly guys who, well, Wallace and um, the other one, um, well, and Baker. They're, they're it's either guys who have been good and want to prove it again, or guys who have played the most football that they've played, like Dodson, for instance. Uh, they've played the most football that they've played, and 
they want to play even more and then own a payday and show that they can do it uh, and be a start in the league, but they hadn't quite shown that in their rookie contract. Right. So if if we if we want to take it there and we just want to compare those two rosters, so his first year they 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 sign a seventy million dollar safety in Marcus Williams from the Saints. They draft Kyle Hamilton at fourteenth overall safety. He plays safety and big nickel. Yeah. They already had two first round corners on the roster. Yeah. Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters. So yeah. right away, you can kind of – the Seahawks do have analogs there, right, via Devin Witherspoon. Do you want me to do their, um, okay. do you want me to do their defensive front? Well, well yeah, what, once we, yeah, once, once sorry, we finish sorry, the next seven years. And then they, they already have Patrick <laughs> Queen on the roster, who at that point is a bust, but it's still the first-round pick with first-round tools. Mm-hmm. And then they trade a second-round pick for former first-rounder Roquan Smith. Um so those are five first rounders in the back seven. Then the sixth guy is a what? The sixth guy is a seventy million dollar safety. That's insane, isn't it? Yeah. Um, That's actually so, insane. So like, they now now did he get Patrick Queen back on track? Absolutely, but he got him back to what he was always supposed to be. Credit yeah, to Mike after he had been uncover zeroed. Right. And credit to Mike McDonald, but the point is, like, he doesn't take average players and turn them into stars. Like, like Geno well, Stone. What about Geno? Geno Stone is one such example, but it's easier for it's easier for a Geno Stone to occur, a Geno Stone phenomenon to occur on your roster if you've got Marcus Williams and Marlon Humphrey sandwiching him in, on the field. This, this, so Geno Stone is your floor player, right? You've got every defensive roster needs floor players and ceiling players, right? The guys that carry the load and the supporting cast. The Seahawks right now, with really the exception of Devin Witherspoon, and supposed to be including Tariq Woolen in that, but we need to actually see that happen. They have a bunch of floor players. Baker might be able to carry a load, but that's a very strong if. I don't know. Rayshon Jenkins, I watched him in Jacksonville. He's a fine player. He's basically what Julian Love was in New York. And what Julian Love wasn't in Seattle, mm. but it's just they—they they, they need the guys to 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 carry the load. Like you don't, Rayshon Jenkins can't be your best safety if you wanna if you wanna go places. Um, and even so, all that talent that we mentioned, the Ravens were a bottom five defense the first eight nine games of 2022 McDonald's first year until that Roquan Smith trade occurred. And that's not to say Roquan Smith is the difference between being a top five defense and a bottom five one. But the, the point is, is that he was able to make a scheme tweak. He doubled Kyle Hamilton snaps. And then there's that multiplier effect where you can become greater than the sum of your parts and find the right roles for everybody. Mm-hmm. He won't have the luxury of finding these perfect roles for Kayvon Wallace and Julian Love and whoever, if he doesn't have other guys that can kind of carry that load. So I'm just saying it's, now, granted, different circumstances, different situation. It's probably naive of me to just say Raven circumstances, you know, that doesn't mean those variables apply here so cleanly. Um, you know, but well, I'm what just it saying, shows, Griff, is the best teams are constructed by the draft. And they're built via the draft, and Seattle has not done a good job of that. Um, they, they've started doing a bit better recently, but they've been kind of – Giving away some picks, and this year it's going to be difficult because they just don't have the top 100 picks anymore, especially after the Sam Howe move. And what they do at 16, potentially maybe trading back is going to be interesting. Uh, but I cut you off just as um, you were going to say what I'm saying is. So that was a really bad interruption. No, go ahead. I'm not. I, I, I said everything I have to say. Well, defensive front wise, again, like if you think about the top 100 picks, you know, which were present when McDonald was there. Uh, so Malik Harrison, who was like a bit part Sam, he was drafted pick 98 overall in the third round. Uh, Tavius Robinson was a round four pick, 124 pick in, in 2023. So not when, you know, the, the, the subsequent year. Uh, Odafi Owe was a 2021 uh, first round pick. Uh, 
Carl Van Noy was like a low cost free agent in 2023. Uh, Clowney again, kind of a low cost free agent, but obviously came with a, a high reputation in 2023. Michael Pierce was an undrafted free agent, but he was signed to a fairly significant contract for, for a nose tackle back in 2022, three years, $16.5 million deal. And then the other, like, let me, Madabrike was a, a round three pick, 71 pick in the 2020 uh, third round. And finally, Travis Jones was a round three pick, 76 pick uh, in the 2022 third round. So there's, uh, you know, looking at all of that, I think the the front seven had a bit more to it than I maybe had thought before I kind of looked at all that stuff. Uh, when you add in the Rokon Smith investment as well, which is obviously, a, a it's, it's not to uh, denigrate what McDonald did, Every defense, every offense that's good required the, the players, right? It always right. does. But it's more just to, it's kind of sobering to look at it and then think, well, yeah, McDonald's this kind of scheme guy who's going to gonna do good things and he's going to get these guys, in theory, playing really well, making less mistakes. But ultimately, if you don't have the guys, you don't have the guys. And I think it's kind of a point at the front office where, again, they've come into this offseason and they're, they're signing these vets to one year deals. They're not keeping like a guy like Jordan Brooks. They're doing this kind of strategy that we spoke about on the one year deal thing. And yeah, they don't have the picks. And it's just very interesting. Like, for instance, one of the vets who they signed to a one year deal, Mario Edwards, is signing with the Houston Texans on a one year deal. It's not that you want him back, but it just seems like who's the next Mario Edwards now? Like, <laughs> there's. These uh these things. Evan Brown is signing the Cardinals on a one year two point three five million dollar deal, the starting center last year. You know, it's it's kind of strange. I, I'm I, what, how does Seattle get out of this? What are they? What's the end goal here? Like at a certain point. Well, they they so you know if, if McDonald is the development guy, they they decided to spend not a lot of money but not a non-negligible amount of money either on a bunch of like quote-unquote role players mm. um and it's... and if you think like if if you add up all that excess spending and think well okay spend you can take some of a percentage of that and spend it on a guy that can actually provide impact like be be a, a load carrier so to speak and then you can spend some of the remainder on maybe one or two of these guys, but th but then but then rely on the depth you already have. Be willing to sign a guy for a million, or then rely on the draft. It, it's okay to go into. It's okay to go into a season where you don't feel great about the floor, um, or, or or to try to ensure you don't have to ensure having a floor via a Tyrell Dodson. Um, you can you can just simply kind of have that position be a question mark and let it sort itself out via the draft, via the camp, via your development. Um, it's I mean they it's been an unusual off season in the sense that they've spent like an aggregate amount of money, yeah, on on like really kind of middle class type players, and it's kind of what you have to do when you have a bunch of dead cap, but. I still feel like the lessons to learn from the Ravens rostering is that you really need the top end players. And if, and if Geno Stone, who was a, who was on the team with minimal investment, if he can take those players and turn them into something, if he can do that with Geno Stone, why can't he do that with Kobe Bryant is my thinking. So mm -hmm. then why go spend the well, and cap dollars at the expense of a Jordan Brooks or an equivalent, you know, um, Right, and look at the, you know, the, you could say the bit part role players who played really good football on the Legion of Boom team. You know, uh, I don't want to cause too much offense to, to certain names, but guys who'd have like one good season or one and a half good seasons and then get paid elsewhere, and that was good for them. But it was because 
partly they were around that surrounding talent, that surrounding culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it's it's a job, and it feels like the Seahawks are treading water. And I don't want to get too conspiracy theory, but the takeover, the the sale of the team, potentially that is in the back of my mind is a thing because I don't know why, like what. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't even really talked guard or, or interior offensive line. No. Well, well, let's finish up on the defense, So, and then we'll talk about that. So the Seahawks are expected to sign veteran defensive tackle Jonathan Hankins uh, per Mike Garofolo. That was ages ago. I, I th- they, they did do that, didn't they? they? Have they done that? He turns 32 in, well, next Saturday. Happy birthday to the, to the big man. And he is a big man because he is... 320 pounds. Why does that matter? Well, if you look at the Ravens' defensive interior last year, they had one, two, three, four, five players over 300 pounds. Four of them, no, three of them were over 310 pounds. Seattle in 2023 had just two defensive linemen over 300 pounds. Nose tackle Jaron Reed, just over 300 pounds, 306 pounds. And defensive tackle Cam Young, who was a fourth round rookie, at 304 pounds. They obviously traded uh, November 1st for Leonard Williams, who was 300 pounds. But they really did lack mass on the interior. And I think the, uh, along with that, the Hankins addition is kind of that ability to play a bigger nose tackle a bit like michael pierce right griff where we theorized maybe they want to play a bit more two-way and while jaron reed could do that um it could you know it's maybe not his best stuff uh but also um it might free jaron reed to play some more three tech which in the game theory is really good at which would then free uh, leonard williams to play some big ends uh, it could also free Jaron Reed to play the big end, which he has done in the past as well. Basically, you might be able to use Jaron Reed as a two-gapper in base, a bit more uh, two-gapping edge, or sorry, two-gapping end. Or you might be able to use... Uh, well, I guess Leonard Williams could do that, but I think you want him more power-stepping still. Anyway, Monjombo asking, is the weight of a nose tackle relevant to their ability to play 2 I or their ability to two-gap? Generally, two right. gappers are, are bigger guys because they're they're having to really kind of catch a guy and and be a, a presence and and uh, they're gonna take a combo team a double team a bit more often. But you don't want to be too heavy because, like as Brian Monet showed, as a two eye, sometimes it's just not it's it's a hard trait because you, you're having to kind of move laterally and and it's just it's just difficult but like Monjombo, a good example is look at michael pierce last year look how he played and in the cut up on seahawks on tape.com you can see that too uh griff as we wait griff are you back in action yeah i'm trying to time it up with your barks so that uh try to time up muting myself as my dog barks very skilled um, very skilled well while you do that griff Henry yeah. striped us some change. Henry, thank you so much. If you want to donate to Seattle Overload, there's a Stripe link. There's also a super chat function. Henry, I really appreciate your support. Um, not the first time, obviously. And uh, if you have a question, please do ask it, Henry. We also had a donation on the last video, which obviously has taken me a bit to get to because we've had our little, well, I don't know if you can call five days a break, but we haven't been here for five days. From uh, Steve Ferrone again. Thank you, Steve, for the donation. Much appreciated. So, Griff, uh, thoughts on Jonathan? Um, they they tend to make this kind of move almost every off season. They tend to work. The only the only three hundred pounder they've brought in, like a veteran three hundred pounder, to play on the interior to be a rotator rotational player that hasn't worked. I think don't, it's been don't oh. lie. Shamar Stefan. Oh, Other than no. that, they have a pretty high hit rate. I mean, he played good football last year. The The only considerations that I have beyond that are, are, are what you said um, of like how they're going to use the nose. They clearly bring are bringing him in to kind of quasi two gap to play the two eye, the mere stepping two eye. And that, make, yeah, it makes you wonder, does that in, is that an indicator of how they want to use their nose tackles in general? And if so, 
that would take Jaron Reed out of what he did really well last year where he was really productive? Or does it mean they want to have at least one guy who can do that and they're making this signing so that they don't want to ask Jaron Reed to, to do that too much? Um, surely yeah. they put on the tape and saw how productive he was as a one technique pass rusher. Yeah. So, um, and Hankins you know, did play some, uh, some uh, quite a bit of two eye, I think, for Quinn last year. They were running a yeah. lot of like over fronts where they had a two eye nose tackle, they're playing nickel, they're playing two high safeties. One of the safeties is probably in a deep quarter, uh, rather than playing for three bars, but a kind of similar line of thinking. So he's kind of that fit, and obviously, he has a familiarity with Adam uh, Dirty. The, New Seahawks defensive coordinator who was his D line coach. So that can't yeah. hurt. Right. Okay. Finally, the Seahawks signed Tremaine Ankrum, adding an anchor to the offensive line. The Seahawks Twitter account tweeted it out. What what do we call X? What do we call X things? Twitter. Are they I'm are not, they zeets? I'm not call, I'm not calling it X. Well, no, obviously, but what what is the what's the official form? Posts, I think. Thank you. I think that's what the they posted out. I think that's what Voldemort said to call it posts and reposts. Mm-hmm. Ankrum is a 25-year-old who turned 26 in June. He was a seventh-round pick in the 2020 NFL Draft. I mean, this is basically a like intriguing uh, athletic profile type guy, right? Like, he's had 33 and 5'8 for an inch long arms. He's a shorter type of guard. But a... Uh, Yeah, I don't, he's had some some experience playing. Like Griff, Griff, have you even watched him? He started one no. game in the NFL. I, I think I, don't know. I, I think what they've done at at O line via Fant, um, Ankrum, and Nick Harris is that it's just well, there's a little more to the Fant signing, but it's kind of a numbers game. They they simply need to have guys on the second string. Um, I don't think they want to feel like they have to draft backups just to fill out the roster. Obviously, you'll draft a guy that you think, hey, eventually could could start, right? Um, but to me, the way they've 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 acquired the roster right now, or put together the O line roster, it definitely signals, which we could have fathomed it uh, to guess already, right? But it signals that they're going to go hard at guard, maybe center, but probably guard on day two of the draft, R- rounds two, three, and four. They're they're likely going to be drafting a guard. Um, they and might surprise us and do it in the first. Like, it. Just looking at it, that seems to be the like a, a solid strength of the draft. Um, oh yeah, and it is a very deep guard draft. And there are like there are a lot of tackles that are going to that are going to be viewed as as guard converts as well, on top of an already strong pure guard class. So yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I mean, it's a fairly a fairly spendy second string O line as second string O lines go. Yeah, and again, speaking to not having draft picks, you know, like there's Anthony Bradford. He's suddenly thrust into the you know the the thing. Um, but then I mean, behind Phil Haynes is gone. Uh, could 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 has he signed elsewhere yet? Who? Phil Haynes. Um, I think he visited Carolina. Right. Is, uh, yeah. I, I love how Canales is like, let's just get the band back together. With all all of them. Uh, he, he brought David Moore back. Um, right. Right. Um, so I imagine Ankrum's deal is not significant at all, but. <laughs> just, Easy, Brady. It's just, the, again, Damian Lewis was. Uh, like a rare kind of solid guard in, in Seahawks. Um, he he was the first times. guard that kind of worked that they drafted. So um, I I, under, I understand. Like I would not have paid him thirteen million dollars, but right. at the same time, if Robert Hunt gets twenty million, 
and Jonah Jackson gets 17. Yeah. I wouldn't like, feel at what too point bad is about an, it. Uh, at what point are uh, what looked like overpays just the going rate for guards now? Yeah. You know, strange. Like, and then, and then the, the conclusions are like, well, does guard matter now more? The league's making a statement. And then in three years when their cap hits balloon, they're going to cut them. And then there's going to be think pieces about how, oh, the league doesn't value guards anymore. It's like, no, they just sign them to, I don't know. They just reach the end of their deals. And they're not going to be paying a guy $25 million cap hit to play guard. Just it's the same thing that happened with safeties this off season, mm. big deals. They all just happen to reach year three and four at the same time. And they all happen to be 30, 31, the greatest crime of all. So yeah, um, I'm not there yet. You're getting there. Griff. The, the, the thing is like, <laughs> it's, if, if, if you don't want to overpay Damian Lewis, fine, but you're doing that in the same off season that you're paying your backup right tackle act real money. It's just a little interesting. I don't know. Um, so I don't know. I, it's, it's like whatever, whatever you had Damian Lewis valued out as that fan deal probably makes up the difference between, or maybe even exceeds it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this draft suddenly, which we're, we're going to be able to preview now, is so, so, so important for Seattle. And, you know, they can't really mess it up. Like they have to trade down from 16 overall, which I get, I mean, they don't have to. Let's not speak in absolutes, but it would be kind of more frustrating given spoke about it but three possibly four quarterbacks are going to go before seattle picks at 16. there's all these offensive tackles which obviously we have to see what happens with abraham lucas but in theory like hopefully is not a requirement for seattle certainly not a left tackle which is the typically the premium position so you would ideally hope to pick at 16 in this draft where you could in theory still get that blue chip type of player still with with all I've mentioned, and yet it's the draft that they just so happen to only have, you know, the, the, the nothing. So, right. And not only that, they needed to, they needed to have something. So, yeah, I am fascinated. Maybe they try and give up some future assets to get back in. Uh, we'll have to see how it all plays out how serious they are about this coming season because right now there's a lot of questions and they still have time to answer them. Um, maybe McDonald can bring a, a few more of his guys up into Seattle. Obviously he did a really good job with how he assembled that a Ravens kind of, uh, defensive roster. Um, well supplemented it with kind of veteran talent, but the, the key is supplemented it. Like he just got the last few pieces, like the Van Noy, the Clowney, to make it pop. Um, I'm not sure we've seen those moves yet in Seattle, but also how are they going to get more blue chip players? Very interesting. They, we, it's it's clear that, like, I, I know people are trying to assess, like, are they what what what's their mo are they trying to be um setting up for the future is it short-term thinking is it long-term thinking and i don't really think it's either one i think they're not i think they're trying to field a competitive team right now and they're also trying to be flexible for, for the future i know people see the moves on defense but at the same time they decided to make efforts to keep tyler lockett they decided to you know uh sign their fourth target to a two-year deal. It would be different if it was a four-year deal. So um, it's it's a little bit of – it's so, like, inconsistent that I don't think we should try to view it through that lens. I think it's them just making case-by-case -case decisions. And I don't think that's inherently wrong. I think we can just judge those decisions for what they are and, and, and kind of dispense from judging those decisions within this context – that we're projecting onto them of, well, they're doing, there's this theme at play. There's that theme at play. There's resetting, there's retooling. Mm. They're saying to hell with the Carol guys, which doesn't make sense because <laughs> what was Noah Fant then? What, what was, what, what was Leonard Williams? I mean, Leonard Williams was the trade to try to put the final stamp on Carol's last hurrah. 
you know, if anyone, don't bring that guy back. Like none of that makes makes sense to me. Don't it's get just, caught up oh, in that grip. It's okay. I think they're just making case by case decisions, and I think that some things also like some things got away from them. I think they felt they succeeded in some areas, and maybe screwed up in others. And the free age, the subsequent moves are just reactions to that, and not bad reactions, but reactions. And the um, last, uh, it was interesting, and you know, for, for all. Uh... For all his differences to Carol and the fact that it's not a coach talking on the radio, and obviously we like our coaches talking, especially Pete, because he shared some cool stuff. Um, but any coach, we, we'd always nerd out on a bit more, given our, we're, we're more inclined that way than front office uh, stuff. But it was interesting hearing Schneider describe how at the combine when Locke signed with the Giants, they were like in a mad scramble to try to get a backup quarterback. That was the other thing which stood out to me from the radio interview him describing that process and like the kind of relief they felt when they found how and how they were really in on that. Um, I guess that's how it works, but it's felt like an off season where just in general, they've kind of been like really having to duck and bob and weave and stuff. But also it's probably like that every off season, we just don't get to hear Schneider talk uh, that openly about it or haven't got right. to hear him talk that openly about it. And honestly, he's sharing quite a lot. I think he's being fairly not um, guarded anymore. Well, I, I do think that, I don't know if how he views it, but I do think that he actually kind of screwed up by saying, by saying that Baker is Will and Dodson is Mike and being really firm about it. Well, I mean, and he, he, said, he also said that, he basically said that they, they're not really going to draft a quarterback. Like he, he, he the way he answered that question was not um sorry uh, let me let me rephrase that I, I i felt he was very he's too open on the yeah. or he he was he didn't need to be as open i liked it it wasn't too open but he yeah. didn't need to be as open as he was on the quarterback thing either and i think the brooks thing like when he was describing how that they that happened too quick for them i think there was a pretty strong bit of honesty there um going on but anyway that's just my yeah. read yeah no i uh, i agree actually um i think what he was surprised by by brooks was that how ready he was to move on um because clearly miami offered and he said well, yes right griff the thing is seattle has uh the great catering and and the culture you know so true, so true. Yeah. But the, the the linebacker thing, I th that's significant though. What he said though, because if he if he had said, if he had said like, well, you know, we we think either one can do both. You know, we'll we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Even yeah, if they're they paying knew, one seven million dollars and they're paying the other like a very small amount, like they're indicating that like yeah, if if Baker, I mean. It doesn't matter what they know behind the scenes is what they say to the public. If, if other teams are in contention for, I mean, there are a lot of, what I'm saying is there are a lot of linebacker needy teams and there are some, there are very few linebackers in this class that I think will be graded very highly. And even then, even fewer of them are Mike's, most of them are Will's. Yeah. And if you're broadcasting to the other teams that are competing with you to draft the linebacker that they want, that you basically have to draft a mic and you can't draft a will like they're saying they're not going to draft they're not going to draft cedric gray or michael barrett or you know whoever take your pick at will even the, of the better wills they're saying we have to draft we have to draft one of the mics now um there's only that said, two of those guys so said, now they know need, their need there was obvious grip it was obvious, but if you had said like, "Well, Baker could play Mike," because that's a yeah, rational it's, thing to say. It, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's sharing a lot. It really is. Yeah. Uh, Jen with a donation. Thank you, Jen. Love you guys. Thank you for helping me learn more X's and O's. You're Thank welcome, you, Jen. Jen. Very kind. And reflect the sun. Got a super sticker. It's, it looks like a green thumbs up thing. So thank you, Reflect the Sun. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Right. I thought I had one more thing to say, but maybe not. How very interesting. Chat, make sure you check out my latest Seahawks on tape.com article. I'm putting it in the comments right now. Share it 
with a friend. Put it on Reddit. Do something. And uh, I need to have more coffee, I think, before before we next do a podcast, which will likely be tomorrow, Griff. I mean, we could do Jalen Ford if, if you really wanted. We could watch him play the mighty Jayhawks. Or okay. we should probably do uh, Dijon Newton, shouldn't we? Yeah. Is he a stick and pick player at uh, 16, perhaps? Especially considering need it makes it interesting, right? Before we do that, we should spend 15 minutes talking like general draft strategy. Um, yes. Scenarios. Yes. Gun to your head. What would happen? Right. Et cetera, et cetera. I keep saying et cetera, et cetera tonight. Okay. Well, yep. We'll be back tomorrow. Similar time. Sure. Sure. Pumped for it. Pumped. Brandon, you're right. I'm, I'm zonked. The lesson is coffee. Um, coffee. Um, and yeah, don't, don't try and get up at, uh, like 6am and with, with like a broken body clock, it's difficult. The words are coming out, but, but slowly, I'm actually going to go watch Jalen Ford after and, uh, I don't know, listen to something which keeps me awake. There you go. Very efficient. Reset the body clock. Cause chat, you know, I have to adapt to the Pacific time clock. Griff, do you have your closing wisdom why are you shaking your head that don't do that i don't because i don't have any closing wisdom